today I'm going to talk about being a dwelling place and in such a way having a dwelling place. So first um, I'll talk about what is home and um, what's most precious might be in the last place you'd look. It becomes the backdrop of a lot of what's going on. The relationships that have become constants. Um, the places that have become familiar. And this might be the last place that we would think is the most precious. We might be seeking as we dwell in these places, these relationships for something more. And everyone has innate sanctity. It's looking outside of that where the sanctity of the home gets broken. There becomes trust and power issues when you don't believe that the one in the family younger than you or smaller than you is as powerful. And this is the sanctity of the home is that everybody has the same power, the same rights, the same abilities, and being concealed is often a power. So the trust issues happen when someone thinks that external power is greater than the internal power. And you know, how does one negotiate power, whether there's coercion? Some sparks have to be hidden to be safeguarded. In other words, for that very place and the very home, family, all of it, relationships to become constants, they cannot seem so special or we might overdo it. We might try too hard. And so they appear less precious. However, that's the very place that gives us most of our identity. If we only feel power because of that relationship, then that's our source of power. So an example of a child running the show is like a ch the inner child of the parent or, you know, an actual child um, in the home is like having a button for a nuclear weapon for the child to press. Could do tremendous damage that's lifelong for everybody involved. And this includes the adult who's behaving um, on impulse and without patience. So this is without sanctity, without sanctity for the time and the experience and the terrible suffering one endures is all for the sake of maturing and evolving. And so, you know, this turns in into relationships, schools, and nations that want to have rulership over one another on the outside. And, you know, some might be this like the manager, one wants to be the manager, and this is like the revealed power, but then the one who's managed could always give more work to the manager. It's a hidden power that the manager always has to keep responding to the one that needs to be managed. So the child who keeps needing the parent's attention and the parent feels they have rulership over the child doesn't realize they're responding constantly to a needy child. This child now is getting more and more power and running the show by being needy and by not having power. So actually all have sovereignty. Everyone has effects, whether you're on the side of the revealed power or the side of the concealed power. The other has to bend to you. And this is the sanctity of the home, is that the father being a provider needs ones who are being provided to. The mother being a nurturer needs ones to nurture. If she's always angry at the children for needing to be nurtured, then she's no longer even recognizing her power as a nurturer comes from those who need the nurture. If the provider is resenting the ones he has to provide to, he's no longer recognizing his power as a provider comes from those he has to provide to. So we may spend life you know, chasing, desiring power, um, even the confirmation of power. We may put ourselves in positions, no matter how much money or subordinates we have, and just keep trying to win. We want to negotiate out so that the revealed power gets shown and we can feel comfortable again that we're in charge. And um, this has a lot to do not just with the structural power in organization or system or the family or the home, but also spiritual power and subordination. What do we submit to? We submit sometimes like, okay, sure, I'm too weak to win. But actually in the long run, we start to see the other one's weaknesses and we start to see where they always feel the need to compensate for their lack of power. And actually their grandiosity is a functional type of grandiosity. They need to feel they have some impact. So the one who's kind of like all power taken away might walk in the street with tremendous attitude and on the sidewalk um, and in the car and in the store and just feel so good for that few minutes when they make someone wait, when someone's waiting for the parking spot or is behind them online. And this really is their compensating and it, and it feeds into the whole system that each one is like, oh, there's not enough power. I need to, to relish what, you know, when I see people waiting outside the restaurant while I'm slowly eating because there's a long line. And so much of this becomes self-control that's wired to not let 
overpower, feel powerful in the power. In other words, you know, we might act like we don't care. We might act like we, it doesn't affect us. We're not bothered. We might pretend that we are so happy and have everything instead of even being upfront and saying it really hurts that you're taking advantage, you know, or I find that, you know, what I'm interpreting this as is that you want to win something here. And like, you know, this actually matters to me. I'm not doing this as a power struggle, but we w won't have those conversations and things to be revealed if we're so busy with the outside, like, oh no, you won't get my power. And this is like when someone's a prisoner and they don't give satisfaction to the guards by crying or screaming or anything that would show that they're being affected. And a child might act like they don't care from a very young age and cement these habits of being aloof. And they say, oh, what a tough, he's so tough, but actually he's breaking down inside because his actual self-esteem built into the identity of having natural sanctity that who he is is already precious instead of how he performs for the one who needs power over and to say, you know, and, and this actually becomes us treating others very casually. And this is the danger is that if we're treating somebody very casually because they act like they're not affected because their, their self-protection doesn't want us to know that we can actually, um, as the overpower, we don't, they don't want us to know that we're actually affecting them. So this ends up um, with so much mechanism that's wired only to prevent those in power to feel the power and then they need more power so the appearance of power versus consciously embodying power is very different and um, facing all the futility the diminution like being made small and the inability the learned helplessness and you know there's a holiness that's masked in the matter there's a holiness a oneness a purity that um reminds us the darkest can be the brightest. So if that one who never really had much power was actually given the opportunity to manage, what would they be like? And it's like the very fat person who's a weight loss coach, um, or, or, or more, more accurately is a, a exercise coach. And this one you might say, well, what do they know about it? But they might be the best just because of their experiences, because of how they know that they're eating too much. They know which exercises more than anyone burn fat and how to stay thinner in this culture where the power is kind of in the someone who might look externally empowered, like they have the money to afford Botox or, you know, a personal trainer or organic fresh food um, or a home with a proper kitchen and so on and um, doesn't and, and is able to afford a lot of self sufficiency so not being with a partner who kind of wants you to eat your feelings instead having you know somebody who recognizes that your power is in making it feel like a home you know in in your presence is is a power your ability to be spacious and understanding instead of somebody saying oh this one's understanding i want to rule this one and they got to understand me and then it becomes like you know a mechanism and then we say well you know i'm being shocked by the things you're telling me but i have to act like i'm not and this is what happens to that child once they grow up and they were treated so casually and not treated like a guest too. They always had to be the host for the guest. Um, you always wanted to be the guest, for example, or I always wanted to be the guest, for example. I wanted the other to cater to me. So finally, the mystery and the hidden always has potential power. This is where... You know, I remember being a teenager in a school, a therapeutic high school. And um, it was very interesting how they told me that I didn't have a tendency to act out angrily, but I would give you a look when I was mad, like I could kill you. And that was scarier. And I remember learning that the potential power often is of greater threat than the one who appears to have power. The one with the handcuffs and the gun might seem more in power, actually, but it's the one who could do anything and doesn't have to follow these rules and use force. They could be in another location. They don't need the physical weapons, for example. And that's when we kind of say the, the, the biggest threat is the unknown. And I'm going to talk about now, I'm going to go to um, how we learn about what happens in the world. What are, some, what are some guidance that we could take about what it means to... to um, like from the scripture, but before I do that, I want to speak about what is it to find hope for the for the home for 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 world or nature feeling like home, and it's being a dwelling place. 
So I'm going to talk about some ways in which we could be a home. We could be outside of the power struggle. And these are ways in which we could actually be the, the guest to all without needing, without catering to anyone. Just being, in other words, being, being a guest, being a guest that you want around and you're also a guest that I want around, and it takes away the power struggle. And um, so it's finding hope. And so I'm gonna run through a few things and ways to find, these are access points to feel at home in the world and for anyone to feel at home and to feel precious and pure. Sharing a piece of me is, is love and generosity. For example, my artwork, um, sharing some of my practices, calling someone, um, spending time with somebody, going to visit somebody, bringing some food to somebody. Grace during the out of moderation period. This is the biggest gift to give to anybody when there's extremes, when there's fears, when there's all over the place. And then of course, it's getting off the high horse, judging favorably. This is a hard one for me, getting off my high horse, recognizing the fear of falling and seeing it in others. Everyone's so precious, so vulnerable. We're trained not to go up or even try. And so having, having um, a sense of, of understanding to those while they're in the out of moderation period, like I described earlier, seeing them with fresh eyes. They're just bouncing inside of extremes, but that's not who they are. And the same thing, and so not even interacting with them as if that's all they are. And of course, also, like I said, when people are not even trying, when, you know, encouraging them and saying, this is someone who is so afraid of falling. They have fallen here. This is the bravest one. And seeing the sanctity and the fallibility of ourselves and others, recognizing the opposite of love is fear. And fear magnetizes anger. Somebody who's always afraid of losing their power will be around angry people. And this is because the angry person can capitalize your fear, which is ruling you inside of you. So being somebody who chooses love instead of fear, not to be afraid of other people, not to be afraid of ourself. When we're afraid of ourselves, we become angry. We repress parts of ourselves. Being bravely honest is to be less self-centered, not to always appear like you're so powerful, like you have it all together, like you're the best one. Like if anyone had to do this, they would never do it better than you. But rather being open to being who we really are is being bravely honest. Practices and tools help for balancing self-control with external control. So our sensitivity, managing our emotions and sensitivity, and this is our responsibility, is a way to help balance when we need to control ourselves or the outside environment. If we control ourselves too much, we've been trained to not appear like we're affected, like for all the reasons I gave earlier, but many others, we may need some tools to break us out of that frozen stuckness and to help us learn trust, move freely, natural living. And um, on the other hand, if we're so used to like quickly texting, quickly calling, quickly eating, quickly smoking, that's a time where we need to practice more self-control of the stillness of not doing. We need to trust other sense when my eyes are broken. So we need to let others see clearly in some areas where we can't. I sometimes have the pit, that empty bottomless pit move to my mouth, to my to my stomach, you know, from my heart. And so there are times where somebody else needs to help me to see clearly where I'm making mistakes from that place. And I need someone to remind me who you are is deeply trustworthy and who you are is deeply strong. Even though in that moment I'm making actions that reflect feeling disempowered or lonely, they remind me so many people love you. You're on a journey. Sometimes people get left behind. Sometimes, you know, you meet people forward. So this, these um, sense of trusting others who have walk this path doesn't mean we let other people tell us what to do. It means we trust their viewpoint. When our viewpoint is not clear, it could be like you can imagine your eyes are crossed or one is in a different direction or they're shaking too much. People have ocular issues. Finally, practicing patience feels good because the feedback is given as a reward or incentive. At the very moment that you feel like... Um, it's the hardest to be patient is when you will have the best feelings. And this mechanism built into us to be patient, to stop rushing life. Like if you're staying by someone's house and they're going to bring you a clean towel, you don't every two seconds call them. They might be on a phone call. 
You act like a guest. You act like I'm lucky that this person's bringing me a towel and I can shower here and they're making you breakfast. You don't rush them every few seconds and it feels good to pause because you realize you're being taken care of and somebody with their own life is taking time to take care of you. So in the beginning, this is just one example, but in the beginning when we practice patience, immediately it tells our body you could calm down, you're safe, all's going to be well. So at first when we initially start to practice patience, it's very worth it because we get a lot of good feedback. And over time, we might notice we're judging a lot in order to protect ourselves from feeling discarded. So the patience now, the work comes from we choose ourselves. So after the initial good, good, good feeling of incentive that our body tells us, yes, please be more patient, we might go into this phase where actually it's, we see all our judgments coming up, that we're so impatient is because um, we, so need, we so deeply want to feel chosen, protected from any abandonment, and we want to make sure we're going to be taken care of. So actually we start to have those deeper rewirings happen where the thoughts that tell us why we shouldn't be patient stop being the loudest thoughts because they actually don't feel good. We start to realize those thoughts don't feel good. And what feels good is a longer term patience that comes from the short term patience. And um, in order to look at this in context, I would say different messages at different moments because of different parts. So I've spoken about different ways as an outlet as an inlet really into feeling at home in the world and in relationships and how we can practice this and do our part. But the most important thing is that sometimes the power struggle, sometimes feeling sanctified, feeling too pure to ever be contaminated and um, so on require us to have a sense of nuance. And this comes from practice. This comes from keeping on doing this work, even when it doesn't feel so good, even when others are not doing it, even when the people who used to do it with you aren't doing it and new people coming in don't do it exactly the way you do. And this is because of gray areas. This is because of when the light and dark are mixing and you yourself are going to have to learn how to surf right there because of your own sense of feeling at home. You're gonna to have to feel at home there. Nobody else could do it for you. So these different messages from these different parts at the different moments come from practicing in all parts of your life. And instead of trying to cultivate everything with power to have everything be completely comfortable the way that you like it every moment, it's gonna come from those moments where you're not sure if it's really comfortable or not, where it's not sure if you could really dwell there. And those are the moments which you stretch, where you expand. And now I'm going to leave off, um, like I said, with from a parsha called Bichu Kosai, which is in the book of Leviticus. It just passed recently. Um, for some people who didn't say it over Passover, it's actually already, um, it, was, it was a couple weeks ago, but now it's being said only because um, over Passover, the Jewish holiday, some became out of order, the scriptural readings, and also it's a leap year. So anyway, this portion... Um, there's seven, there's five series of punishments that happen if we do not listen to God or the source or the set, the source of patience, um, the source of love, the source of being at home. If we are not a dwelling place for God in the world, for love, for peace, for understanding, and we become the one who is trying to rule over others or have this outside power of matter. Um, in other words, we don't perform what we're supposed to do, but we dis decide only to do our own will, um, and we want short-term gratification and we consider like you know the rules of being kind and and being honest as as loathsome and we we reject the ordinances to treat others the way we want to be treated and you know we you know um we we listen to the fear and we become angry or you know we don't perform the good deeds and and the ways of making a dwelling place for love in the world um it annuls the covenant, it annuls that circuit we have with the creator of all that's concealed power, all the concealed power which could happen. We actually violate that. And these are some things that start to happen. So this is the first series, Punishment Series A. We will have swelling lesions, burning fever, frustrated longing in the souls and the eyes without satisfaction, sowing seeds that will produce crops for the enemy, being struck down before the enemy, being subjugated or having panic, and finally fleeing without even being pursued. And then if we still do not change our ways, and we don't question why is nature not being a good host to me, if we're not being a good host to the true nature, then we, the, the, the pride of our might is broken, which is translated as the temple, but you can apply it in your life. Your home will not feel secure or sanctified if you're not being a home for the sanctity and the, the 
the safety in the world. Um, heaven will be made of iron. The land will be made of copper. Strength will be spent in vain. Earth will not yield crops. Trees will not yield fruit. And what does grow will drop before it's mature. And if we still treat casually, you know, the, the very people who are, who are doing all this work and we're becoming even a heavier burden on the world of those who have to clean up our mess and, and we refuse to take accountability, then we'll be tormented in other ways with wild beasts. Domestic animals will, will be decimated, poisonous snakes, death of children, loss of livestock, diminution of the population, and desolation of roads. If we continue to still not change our ways and become, you know, more to, to follow that inner voice, to become more still in the world, to become less greedy, then, and to not, you know, to be, and to stay judgmental, to stay so judgmental and to stay, stay so extreme, um, you know, then there's the sword, the, the number D, the fourth set of punishments of seven, the sword of foreign invaders, the siege of forcing people into cities, plague, lack of fuel, crumbling bread, constant hunger, food shortage, and people will even eat the flesh of their sons and daughters. And it's not clear if they'll be eating the actual children or if they'll be eating the flesh, which was meant to be to sustain their children, like their children's food. Um, and I would like to give like my own little personal, being, being at home in the world, um, for me is, is working and, and being a home for nature in the world is not like I get into these feeding frenzies, like a cat, um, or a snake. And, um, it's because I didn't eat properly. And then I get so hungry, I overeat and it feels like my jaw is unhinged and I just can't get enough food. And so this set D really, I really connect to that. I think those moments where I feel like there's just not enough food, I can't get satisfied is like, how deep have I gone into not trying to satisfy the true nature rather than these like external ways of feeling powerful. And finally, if still casual and not heeding, you know, the true power, the, the source of power, the true home that we're given and all our blessings, finally, these are the last ones, is cannibalism, destruction of defense structure, death of people, the loss of the Shekhinah, which is the divine presence, the destruction of cities, desolation of the sanctuaries, and God's refusal to accept our offerings. And however you relate to this, it's definitely worth it to, you know, the world is hosted, to, to remember that the world is hosted by the self, and the self hosts the world. I'm going to say that again. The world is hosted by the self and the host and the self is hosted by the world. That's the right way to say that. We host the world and the world hosts us. The sanctity of being a dwelling place meets the sanctity of being in a dwelling place. And that crossover is where we'll find this, uh, the self, this really the part of us, the deep part of us, the oneness. That's where we will find when we can dwell in that place of our nature. So I wish that for you. Be well.